that day um, quite well. And I don't even think it took two minutes for you to convince me to give a talk because your group sounds absolutely fascinating. And I'm so honored to be here. Um, really grateful for everyone joining in this evening. So um, I'm going to start sharing the screen. I have thousands of screens open, so I have to make sure I choose the right one. Right. So yes, um, the title of the talk today is Clash of the Crabs, Competition Under Climate Change. Um, and I'll first, before I begin, sort of talk about, you know, who I am and my research and how this came about, because I think the history of the topic is as important as, you know, what the findings are. Um, this is not the primary point of my PhD research. Um, I study, as you'll see shortly, malacrustacean sensory biology, which is a mouthful. Um, I specifically look at ways organisms uh, perceive uh, information, respond to it, um, make decisions based upon it. And um, I, I will talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. This project, however, came about because of my time in the intertidal habitat and how I noticed things were changing very, very quickly. So as I mentioned, my name is Ari Drummond. I'm a PhD student at the University of Plymouth. I'm in my second year of my degree. I have formed a little group to assist me in my research. Um, it is at the top of the screen called the Crab Lab. The Crab Lab is basically just a group of students that can get together and um, work together to investigate a diversity of research topics, all of which um, center around crustaceans, not just crabs, but all sorts of crustaceans. Uh, specifically, I have chosen crustaceans, one, because that's what I studied for my PhD, but more importantly, because they're an excellent model system in biology, not just marine biology. Crustaceans inhabit a diverse habitat, a variety of habitats around the world, in the land, um, in the sea and on land. And they are incredibly diverse, incredibly complex animals that have an, a really long evolutionary history. Uh, so they make a great model organism for understanding things like sensory biology but also understanding um, evolution and change in response to environmental situations, uh, whether that is rapid environmental change or slow environmental change, because they've seen it all before. So this is me um, having a good time out in the rock pools. Uh, this is Mount Batten. I work in three field sites, Mount Batten, Hannaful Point in Cornwall, and Wembury Beach in um, Devon. So my sites are spaced, not exactly equidistant, but they're reasonably good facsimiles of um, different sorts of intertidal habitats that you find along this coast. Some like Wembury being more exposed, a lot more rugged. I can attest to that when I was out this weekend getting battered about by the wind. Others like Hannafort, still quite exposed, but a little bit more sheltered due to that island and creating sort of a, um, almost a wind shadow, depending on how the wind is blowing. And Mountbatten being really well protected because of the breakwater. And these environmental variables play a really big role in what I'm seeing be because of how they either facilitate or prevent um, this clash from occurring. As I said, I study Malacostrocan sensory systems. Malacostroca are crustaceans. They are crustaceans that include true crabs, like this blue crab here, photographed on Christmas Island. Uh, Christmas Island is actually where I rediscovered my love of crabs and marine biology. Uh, as a child, I was one of those little girls running around to the beach, absolutely certain I wanted to be a marine biologist, um, not having any idea of what that actually entailed, but loving 
hermit crabs and crabs just fascinated by how they moved and how they vanished into burrows I forgot about it as I aged one and then um, rediscovered how cool these creatures are when I was in Australia visiting Christmas Island um it's a it's a wonderful island if you ever get the chance to go I highly recommend it not just for the crabs but for the all of the ecosystem that you find there uh, but the diversity, the abundance and diversity of crabs on such a small island was just awe-inspiring. So I began to sort of look at crabs as a great organism to study for a PhD. This is also a member of the Malacostraca. This is my primary study species, Pagaris benhardus, or the common hermit crab. Um, I find these little individuals incredibly charismatic and fun. I can't imagine doing a PhD at this point on anything else. PhD involves hours and hours and hours of staring at tiny animals, doing things in the lab or responding to certain conditions. Um, it requires so much time that I think finding an organism that you just love to work with really makes a big difference. Which, lucky me, I've not just found one organism I love to work with, I've found two. So this is a spheromid isopod, Spheroma serratum. There's actually two here. This is a mating pair. And um, during my time at Wembury Beach in particular, I started to see isopods doing things in the intertidal, did some research and realized not much has been done on marine isopods. So since my PhD was sort of moving in an interesting direction, I decided why not combine hermit crab sensory systems with isopod sensory systems and try and understand how these really cool crustaceans get information about the world and make decisions. And can we use isopods and help, can that help us understand even more how intertidal organisms are making decisions and how that sort of compares to what's going on in terrestrial systems? You may know these guys, um, their relatives live in your garden all over the UK, um, the common name being woodlice. And this might look a little bit more like your typical wood louse, just a little bit more wet, another species of isopod. So currently I'm looking at about five different species of isopods, two species of hermit crabs, and the predominance of my research is I'm hoping you can see the little cursor focusing on this front portion of the animal the head where they have antenna two different pairs of antenna but they also have lots of sensory hairs on their feet so it's sort of like crustaceans have the ability to taste and feel what they walk on which I don't know if I'd want that ability. That doesn't sound like the best of abilities, but in terms of something to study, it's really, really exciting and cool. My primary study site is the Rocky Intertidal. This is where my talk begins. This is where this project begins. The Rocky Intertidal is an incredibly dynamic site. You can go to the exact same GPS coordinates on different days, even just a week apart, and the changes that you can find will be astounding. Seasonal changes such as um, variation in kelp cover, um, longer term changes in the fauna and the flora that you find present in these habitats, wave movement that shoves these really big rocks all over the place, winds and currents that stir up sediment and cast it all over into the pools and into the channels. It's an incredibly interesting place to work. It also can be incredibly challenging. Um, the conditions I just mentioned rain and storms and wind and currents changing everything can mean one day when you're a PhD student and you go to a pool where you normally reliably collect a bunch of hermit crabs for your behavioral experiments, the next day there's nobody there. And all that you find instead is sediment. Perfect example is 
Mountbatten this past Monday, in fact, just yesterday, wow. So I went to Mountbatten, went to the pool where I normally collect hermit crabs for my experiments, and it was just sediment tossed up into the rock pools. This happened last year as well. Winter storms generally do cause this kind of change. And with time, that will go away and be replaced by help and rock and other conditions. So it's ever changing. The organisms that live in these habitats then also have to be adapting to and surviving these changes. Uh, and if you know, if you picture yourself as a little hermit crab or a little isopod that has to survive constant change in your habitat, you've got to have some pretty solid methods of doing that. So these organisms are adapted to their environment and they are capable of withstanding a lot of change. We think as humans of rocky shores as incredibly difficult. Yeah, I wonder sometimes if I was a crab, I would find this difficult. Or would it for me sort of just be the norm? Because this is the norm of the habitat. Either way, the rocky shore is a, is a, is a site of change. It's a site of diversity. And it's a site of beauty. Which begs a question. When you exist in a site that is sort of characterized by change what does that mean when you have this extra layer of change that is changing the change you normally experience in other words what does climate change mean for our dynamic rocky shores are organisms already well adapted to handle change because they're used to it anyway it's just kind of what they what they put up with as part of being a rocky shore organism or are they already so stressed by dealing with this constant change that any additional change on top of it is going to sort of push them over the edge now there's a lot of different research that's been done on this and it really varies with species what we predict will happen what evidence indicates will happen and we've lots of good research on how climate change might impact our rocky shores some of it not so bad some of it really really catastrophic for someone like me who studies you know animal behavior physiology to a lesser extent my interest is more about how, not just how these organisms will respond, but since this is gonna happen, what does their new habitat look like? What will be the sort of, um, the new information that they will have to gather and respond to? And um, also, what does this look like when you have other organisms sort of coming in? Because when we think about climate change, we think about increases in temperature and perhaps, you know, weather pattern changes and sea level rising. But one of the things that frequently sort of either gets forgotten or maybe overlooked a little bit is that climate change will be changing, not just the distribution of our local species, but it's going to be facilitating the introduction and expansion of species who are currently in one band of their habitat and are gonna be able to sort of move into another. They're gonna be able to move northward into our habitats. And that's what I've been seeing. So climate change, this um, slide, what I'm really trying to show here is that it, it offers some interesting challenges. One um, on the left, you have shells. Now this image was actually taken shortly after that marine heat wave we had this summer when before this image, I did not find lots of dead snails on the rocky shore. Yeah, I'm kind of used to finding them generally as part of my research, but 
after that marine heat wave, I noticed a lot of smaller species of snails. There were extra shells everywhere I looked and there were not as many hermit crabs. On the right is a Pagris binhardis. Generally, when the tide drops, they are usually pretty resistant to uh, coming out of the water. They prefer to either hide under seaweed if the water level has dropped and they are not submerged anymore, or um, they prefer to remain submerged, generally, if they can. Um, yet this individual and a few individuals last year during the marine heat wave, the number of individuals I saw out of the water had jumped significantly. Uh, this would be a great research project in the future to look at more fully. Um, but we noticed that this was quite a significant increase in the number of individuals out of the water for a species that is not desiccation tolerant and generally doesn't like to be out of the water. What this suggested to us was it was possible that these hermit crabs were not capable of withstanding either the extreme temperature or what you can't see in this photograph is this is a sunny sky that came between two bits of rain the amount of rain we experienced last summer was really intense um and we were monitoring the salinity levels in the rocky shore and noticing that all of this extra rainfall was causing the salinity to drop quite significantly so there was low salinity and quite high temperatures in these pools and as a result we were watching these hermit crabs die they were just trying to come out of their shells and they were really struggling and they weren't surviving now that wasn't all of the organisms but it was a sufficient number to be not just noticeable it was something we could actually just sit down and see um but it was also something that was i guess after looking at these animals for two summers already i had never seen before I'd never seen the like of it and when we you know compared what we saw in upper shore rock pools that were quite warm and very um hypersaline with lower shore rock pools we didn't we didn't see any of that in the lower shore on the same day so um, that led to a research project that some students have helped me with, looking at the physiological effects of climate change on these organisms. And we are getting some really good data to suggest it's actually going to be quite severe. But those are sort of the known vulnerabilities of the rocky shore, right? It's, it's hot. Storms will lead to too much rain and extra disturbance and shifting rocks and boulders and maybe destroying habitat and ripping up the algae and the waters will rise. But it's this last thing that I've, I've noticed that we don't talk about nearly enough, which is how climate change can help the rocky shore get some new friends. And what do these new friends, these new species that haven't really been around before, at least not in this abundance, um, what do they mean for the animals already living there? So it's this notion of range shifts and range expansion. So we know that the temperature, the salinity, the pH really determines who lives where in marine ecosystems and the rocky shore being no exception. We're kind of expecting that climate change, that increase of temperature, that potential decrease in salinity due to excess rain and combining that with sort of ocean acidification, we're expecting there's going to be a shift in the animals that live on our local shores. Given that, what does that mean, again, for the species that already live there? Now, I'm sure many of you will recognize this little hermit crab. I had never planned to study this hermit crab. Um, I'd didn't even know they existed in uh, along the UK southwest coast until I, I think one day I was out in Wembury Beach and I saw this beautiful bright red inside a shell and my research being on Pagaris benhardis a common hermit crab that is just not how they look so I got really really excited 
oh my gosh, it's a new species of hermit crab and one I've not seen before. What is this? And, um, you know, I went back and I looked it up and was, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. It's a new species that I don't usually see. I'm out here all the time. How exciting. Little did I know at the time that though named St. Piran's hermit crab, this hermit crab is not actually one of our native species. Now, some of you will remember that the St. Piran's hermit crab has been in our rocky shores before. Research has suggested that this hermit crab arrived in the 1950s or 60s um, with warm water currents, abnormally warm water currents that came up out of the Mediterranean, up the coast of France and shot them directly into our uh, sort of southwest coast, Devon and Cornwall. And they did really well here for a while, especially when that temperature was uh, conducive to helping them sort of disperse their larvae. Hermit crabs disperse their larvae into the sea. Their larvae have to survive for somewhere around 60 days in the open ocean before getting washed back into the intertidal and settling to find shells. So when the water temperature was warmer, these guys were able to survive along our coast. But then the water temperature dropped again and they all went away. Now this coincided with some um, environmental catastrophe. Uh, I'm sure many of you will remember. So there was some consideration that that was actually the deciding factor in their inability to thrive. However, it doesn't seem like that is in actuality what caused them to decline. Um, it seems much more likely based on current research that it was the temperature decrease that impacted their ability to stay here. So I say they're new friends, but they've actually been in our local intertidal habitats before. Um, so this is a return of these friends. Uh, and they have the potential to interfere with our native species. So big question is, why would that be, right? What are they competing for? Why Why wouldn't they just, oh, well, live happily together? I mean, there are other hermit crab species in our local shore, albeit quite rare ones. Why wouldn't they be able to coincide? Well, to understand that question, you have to understand a little bit about hermit crabs. So these are some land hermit crabs from Christmas Island. Um, this is an image when they're starting to align themselves up in what is called a vacancy chain. Um, the hermit crabs sort of align themselves by size when they find a large shell on a beach that's available. The largest one will start to investigate. All these other hermit crabs will come along and sort of form a little chain. And they'll all do this thing where they sequentially change shells. And um, sometimes hermit crabs will cut the line and snag this shell away because actually shells, especially on the beach, are really limited resources. Much of the time, shells are a bit too small for the hermit crabs. Um, there's lots of damage, there's lots of wear, there's cracks, there's missing spires, which have holes, which allow water to escape. And these guys need water to survive. So it can be quite difficult to find the right type of shell. But hermit crabs, have to have shells and this is why so if you've never seen a hermit crab without uh their shell i get to um because i measure all i collect all these measurements on hermit crabs all sorts of morphometric analyses um based on claw size and body size and the presence of eggs and parasites and things like that so i very gently when i get a hermit crab into the lab i remove it from its a field shell I do my assessments and then I give it a new shell and that's supposed to be, you know, exactly what it wants. We, we have run experiments and, um, you know, gathered enough data to predict what kind of shell this hermit crab will want to use. And uh, I'll give it a nice new shell and then I'll put it in an experimental treatment and watch what it does and then make sure it's nice, 
a healthy and happy, well fed, and then send it back to the beach where it gets to continue on in a better shell, hopefully, than it came in with. But hermit crabs have this really soft, squishy abdomen. That is true of all hermit crab species, except um, a, the largest of all hermit crabs, which is the giant robber crab or coconut crab. Uh, they live in the tropics and in, in the Indian Ocean and that area. Um, they're really cool organisms, but they will actually have their abdomen um, calcified. So they're the only or calcified, um, keratinized. They will have they they are the only hermit crabs that don't really require a shell, uh, but our local species do. Um, in many ways they're quite similar, but they're also different, and it's these differences which could lead one or the other to thrive in our local shores. So. Here are some images that I've taken out in the rocky shore of these two species, the common hermit crab and the Mediterranean hermit crab. Now, I will be calling it the Mediterranean hermit crab to emphasize the fact that while we call it St. Perrin's, it lends this idea that it's a native species when it's it's really not. So I think it's important that we recognize um, just that it, it's actually a Mediterranean species, it emphasizes that it's this warmer water species versus our common hermit crab, which might not be so common anymore if, if we're not a bit mindful. So big question for me, going back to this slide, you see they're in the same shell. Um, there's a different sort of biofouling over the surface of the shell, but they're using dog whelk shells. Um, and this, seeing this amino title got me to wonder if they were actually using the same shell resources or if there was some difference. Because if they're using the same shell resources, they might be in competition, which is when an animal uses a common resource, which has a, in, has a finite supply. Shells are finite. They're not going to be always available in all habitats all the time. Now in the rocky inner tidal, there's lots of snails. Snails are constantly dying, getting eaten. Then the shell becomes available. So there is an abundance of shells for the current amount of hermit crabs we have. However, you introduce a new species or a new species starts to um, overtake different habitats. That situation has the potential to change because again, it's a finite resource. There's only so many of them. But there's also lots of different species of shells. So maybe they'll use different species or maybe different sizes. So there is some room for there to be sort of a separation. Of interested in looking at this and seeing if that would be the case. Would they compete or would there be some separation of what they use? So I started looking into these two species um, doing some preliminary work to try and understand their biology and physiology. And what I found was that the common European hermit crab or the common hermit crab, Pagaris, does quite well in cooler water, um, but it doesn't like salinity changes. It's not good with dealing with desiccation at all. If given the choice, it will not come out of the water even when the conditions start to deteriorate takes a certain amount of deterioration for it to start to come out of the water. And while they're gregarious, there are a lot of them in a small space, they're generally not social. In contrast, the Mediterranean hermit crab, Libinarius, they do really well in warmer water. They're more active in warmer water. Um, they are much better with fluctuations in salinity. It doesn't seem to bother them nearly as much. They're very desiccation resistant and will regularly not just come out of the water, but stay out of the water during low tide, sometimes even with the aperture of their shell facing up. And they seem to be social. Um, it's something that I'm currently working on examining more fully, but they group. Uh, they do not mind being one right next to the other. And oftentimes, if you drop a Clibinarius in with a bunch of other Clibinarius, 
um, that new individual will go towards a group of Clebinarius, they won't avoid it. When you do the same with Pagoras, they chase each other around a bowl. They do not want to be right next to each other. They're often engaging in aggression, aggressive encounters. Um, Clebinarius, by comparison, sure, they'll fight for shells, they'll compete for resources, but they're much more tolerant of the presence of conspecifics and they they group together. They form these nice little clusters of individuals. Um, and generally on the rocky shore where you find one Clebinarius, you find 60. They're really quite abundant in clusters. In terms of both species, what I've noticed is that they both do pretty well. Um, while, you know, Pagoras does a bit better at the colder end of the spectrum, they both do well at that 15 to 20 C range, which is sort of typical of our waters, at least spring, late spring through the autumn time. Um, they both seem pretty good at 27 to 40 PPT. Now that is a big range. Um, and Pagoras does a little bit worse with the fluctuation, but both of them survive quite well. It doesn't seem to impact them too much, at least in terms of their behavior and their use of their habitat and seeking shells and eating and respiring and doing what is required to stay alive. And they both engage in shell fights and shell changes because most importantly, they both need shells. They're obligate users of these gastropod shells, empty shells. So I got to wondering, well, in terms of their environmental parameters, they seem like they could use the same habitat, not just in terms of the rocky shore, but the same kinds of pools. So I went out to the field to try and see where I could find Clebinarius and where I could find Pagaris. And surprise, surprise, I find them in overlapping habitats. In fact, in Hanafor, there is a specific pool where I go frequently to monitor the situation. And they are found in, you know, not exactly equal numbers, but they're found right next to each other, using the same rocks, exploring the same habitat, eating in the same areas. So they are right next to each other. In some cases, you'll find in a grouping like this, this is all Clebinarius in this instance, but sometimes you might find a single Pagaris um, sort of off to the side. Now, I don't have a great image of that, unfortunately, but this would be a really a common pattern that I might find is this nice big cluster, all of Clebinarius, maybe a couple snails off to the side, and perhaps one or two Pagaris sort of at the margins of this cluster. Why that happens, we don't exactly know. Why even Clibinarius cluster and Pagaris don't, we don't really know yet. But that is a general situation that I've observed. So they do use the same habitat. But what about the same shells? Now, anecdotally, it looks like they do. I've shown you now two sets of images with Pagaris and Clebinarius using similar shells. So previously, the images were shown, showing them using dog whelk shells. Here we see them using common periwinkle shells. And yeah, there's, you know, it looks as though there's that potential for true competition. So I decided to collect a whole bunch of crabs and see if that was in fact the case. Were they actually using the same shells? Now I make this sound like a, a really simple question and a really easy task. Now it is a really simple question. All it requires is, you know, a researcher with a lot of time on her hands going off to the rocky shore and collecting a lot of crabs making sure they can't change out of their shells, bringing them back to the lab, taking a bunch of measurements, and then um, testing to see if they'll use the same, same shells in the lab. Will they actually compete for these resources? In actuality, to make sure I did this right, um, it took just over a year at three sites, um, two of which I'm not, I'm only just finishing for now. I've finished with Mountbatten, but Wembury is incredibly difficult 
for me to get to. I have to take public transport, carry these nice big buckets filled with crabs and seaweed and all this stuff to and from the sites. Um, and it, it's a lot of work. So what seems like a really simple question, and in fact is a really simple and important research question, takes a lot of time and effort. But that dedication has really paid off because I can look at this issue by addressing differences in species use. And when I say that, I mean the differences between Pagaris and Clebinarius in the species of shell they will use. I have also looked at this in terms of differences in the size of the shell, by which I mean the masses of the shells. Are, are they species for species using shells of similar sizes, similar mass? And then I went and went a step further than that and looked at similarities in the architecture of the shell. So when I say shell architecture, what I mean is that you look at the shell, such as what this Pagaris Bernhardus is in, and you'll notice that shell has a length, a width, a depth. Um, there's the length and width of the aperture opening. There's other morphological features that define that shell. Shells, when they die, when the snail dies, they don't remain stagnant. They get broken down through where um, water will cause them to break down. Organisms in the water will cause the shells to break down. So there's a lot of variation even within a single species of shell and what that shell looks like and how these um, different architectural features might impact the ability of a crab to carry that shell. So I went and looked at everything that I could on the use patterns that these two species had for these different shells that they were found in. And the first thing that I found was in terms of species. Are they using the same species of shell? Well, actually, yes. Now there is difference, but predominantly the major choices of shell, the, the shells that are used the most frequently are the same between the two species. These being the common periwinkle, dog whelk, and turbine shells. Um, some of the smaller species of turbine shells, um, Sterimphalus, Neuraria, and Bilicalis, some of these littler, littler turbine shells and smaller species of shell in general, I have found more frequently used by Pagaris, but this either may be because the, it, I've had better luck, one, with finding smaller Pagaris than I have with smaller Clebinarius. Pagaris is a smaller species overall. It's moderately, um, well, no, it's significantly, but it is slightly smaller than Clebinarius. Um, even controlling for body length, it's just a less massive species. But also Clebinarius is kind of a, a newer population. So when I go to the rocky shore, I find all sizes of Pagaris. I have not had the same luck with finding all sizes of Clebinarius. I am starting to, especially at Wembury, but at some of the other sites, I just haven't seen that much a diversity in the size of the crabs. There have predominantly been somewhat larger crabs that I've been able to find. That could be because the smaller crabs are either using a different part of the rocky shore and I've just not found that part yet, or it could be something else going on. Um, knowledge which I am yet to be privy to. So. Moral of the story, yes, they're using similar species of shells and there's a lot of overlap there. The next question was, are they using the same size of shells? So are the same size of crab, when we're controlling for mass, are they using the same size of shell? So again, collecting all of this data, I ran my analysis and while there's a significant difference, it's really small. When you look at a crab 
and that crab is Clibinarius and it weighs 0.5 grams. And you look at a crab and a Pagarus and it is 0.5 grams. The likelihood is they will be using a shell that is pretty much the same size. Clibinarius tend to produce, prefer slightly heavier shells, slightly more massive shells. And while that finding is significant, again, the difference is quite small. So also this will suggest that there's some competition going on between the two species. This is looking at just Litterina littorea shells. However, when I've run some preliminary analyses on other species of shell, I find the same thing. It's a consistent pattern that Clibinarius mass for mass will prefer slightly heavier shells to Pagaris. But while that is significant, the difference between the masses of shell, they're not great. They're quite small. So finally, I was interested in looking at shell competition in terms of the architecture of shells. Now, this took a lot of time and effort. Um, I measured a total of 24, 25 different morphometric shell traits. So not just the length, width, and height, but um, the radius of the shell, if it approximated a circle, um, the volume, how much excess water could fill the shell, um, the length of the spire. I looked at um, some ordinal data looking at how much biofouling was present on the shell, how much damage was present, um, how worn the shell was. And I then also compared all that data with morphological measurements of the crabs themselves. And ultimately running some really, really complex analyses, which I'm currently writing up into a paper. Um, so I will ask you, please don't take a picture of this. It is uh, going into papers. Um, so I'm sharing the results with you as sort of before they go into, um, before we submit them for publication. But what we found is that when you look at all of these different architectural features, and it doesn't matter whether you look at them, there, there's lots of different ways you can look at them and sort of combine variables and um, extract the information. But no matter what tests we ran, we found a great deal of overlap between the architectural preferences uh, between the two species. So while again, there is a difference, we all of these differences were significant, they were so small that they're biologically negligible. So what I mean by that is, sure, a, a Pagaris might prefer a slightly shorter shell to a Clibinarius, but the difference is in terms of point X millimeters. So maybe 0.2 millimeters. It's not, it's not a great deal of difference. And it's consistently, again, it seems to be related to the shell mass and the shell species. So primarily the competition is based on access to resources, those shells that are of the right species that are available, that are of a mass um, that works for that crab. The one thing that we found that was really interesting in this research was it was not just the mass that was important, it was also the opening of the shell. Not the entire volume, not the entire length, width and height of the shell, but just the aperture where the crab enters and appears. And this portion where you see this lovely little crab sort of sticking its head out, that's the aperture. It's coming out of the aperture of the shell. And the architecture of the aperture is really important. And it's important for both crabs in kind of the same way. Um, especially for Clibinarius, they prefer slightly more open shells. But again, difference is not significant. Well, it's significant, but it's not. It's so small, it's not really practical to talk about in some ways. So ultimately, are they in competition? Well, even in this figure, you can see Pagaris and orange, Clibinarius and red, they are pretty well overlapped. The one bit of difference is this little group 
off to the right where it was pretty much just Pagoras and that whole cluster is a bunch of small Trevin shells. I think the reason that we don't see a lot of Pagoras isn't because, or I'm sorry, we don't see a lot of Clibinarius in this cluster isn't because they're not using those shells. It's because I haven't been able to find that size Clibinarius in an appreciable quantity. So with more research and more sampling effort, I would predict we would see them using those shells as well, although that's an area for, for further study, most definitely. So they're in competition. We have a non-native species, beautiful it may be, who has come up from Mediterranean shores on currents that distribute larva, um, allow that larva to survive because the currents are warmer than they used to be and have arrived on our rocky shores and are finding a home here. They're thriving and they are using the same resources as our native species, which could mean that our native species has some extra stress to contend with. Does that mean that Clebinarius might outcompete our native species? Well, this is something I'm I'm currently looking at investigating in terms of how they compete for shells and kind of if they're fighting over shells, who tends to win? So I guess I could give a talk on that in the future, maybe. But the big question about will this new species outcompete our current species isn't just based on its ability to you know, gain shells and keep them. It's also based on what other stressors our native species is facing. So it's not just facing this new species, it's also facing climate change that is allowing this new species to arrive on our shores. So when we think about this sort of who has a competitive edge, who might win in the clash of the crabs over shells, given this changing environment, given that climate change is going to be causing the rocky shore to become a different sort of place. Well, the water is going to be warmer. Um, and when we look at how Pagoras does relative to Clemenarius, it seems to do a bit worse. And the water might be less saline. There's going to be a lot more freshwater input from rain. And while Clemenarius seems okay, Pagoras does quite a lot worse. And when you have the interaction of warmer water and less saline water, Pagoras does a great deal worse. And Clibinarius seems pretty okay. And then we think about how resources are distributed throughout the population. Pagoras not wanting to aggregate, not wanting to, you know, stick with its buddies, it disperses resources. It grabs a shell and runs away with it. Whereas Clibinarius aggregates. So even if it may not engage in those um vacancy chains that land hermit crabs uh, engage in for shell exchanges. It may do, I don't know that myself, but the aggregation pattern generally means that there's enough Clibinarius that when a new shell becomes available, another member of that little group can grab it up nice and quick before a Pagoras could get to it. So Clibinarius can, in theory, remove shells from the pool of resources and keep them better than Pagoras. And then when we look at shell preferences, one of the things that was really interesting in my findings was that Pagoras, they use the same shells, but they use slightly smaller shells. And Clibinarius prefer the same shells, but use slightly larger shells. Now this poses a real problem for Pagoras because as crabs grow, they need to find bigger shells. Bigger shells require older snails to die and make those shells available. So the rocky shore is full of lots of little shells, but it's not as full of larger shells. So as shell mass, shell size increases, the abundance of that size resource decreases. If you're a hermit crab needing a larger shell as you grow, you need to have access to these larger shells. So an organism comes in and removes 
extra large shells, that can pose a problem. And that is my concern with Clibinarius. It's not just that they're using the same shells and it's not that there's like even a direct mass for mass competition. It's that because they are using specifically slightly larger shells, that is removing that size resource from Pagoras who will need it as they grow. This could restrict the growth of individual Pagoras. Uh, hermit crabs regulate the growth, we think. That's what research seems to suggest. Um, if they have a shell that is too small, they slow their growth. This can cause a whole bunch of problems for molting, for limb formation and development, for egg masses. Um, it, it's not a good thing for the species. They need those nice big resources to grow and you know, become you know, reproductively viable adults. When those shells aren't available, the individual can suffer. So Clebinarius is getting all the nice big shells before Pagris can get its claws on it. That can be a source of concern in terms of this competitive interaction. So Clash of the Crabs, who's the winner, who's the loser? My research is suggesting that Clebinarius, the non-native species, is probably going to be winning a lot of these competitive exchanges. And Pagoras is not going to be faring as well. One of the findings that I've observed and have yet to statistically analyze is that of my three sites, competition is clearly strongest at Wembury Beach. That's where I find the most um, Clebinarius. But it's also where I find the smallest Pagoras on average. Um, there's a little bit more work to be done to tease that out, but it appears to be Mountbatten and Hanafor, I find quite large Pagoras in nice big shells. In um, Mountbatten, I don't really find many Clibinarius. They are there. Their population is growing a little bit. In Hanafor, their population is expanding quite rapidly. Um, but the habitat at Hanafor is, is huge. And depending on where you are in that habitat, it's still quite possible to find Pagoras who are not really coming into contact frequently, if at all, with Clibinarius. And they are in quite good shells for their size. But at Wembury Beach, I'm not finding this. And in fact, I'm even struggling sometimes to find enough Pagoras to run my analyses. Um, Clibinarius, not a problem. I can go to a few rock pools pretty consistently, reach my hand in, pick them up, and I've got 75. Pagoras, I can spend an hour looking and looking and looking and find enough individuals to run the competition experiment I'm currently running, but all of the individuals I'm finding are much smaller than I would expect it and, and that I find at any of my other field sites. So this has a real meaningful effect on the population. And um, I think the thing that concerns me as an individual who loves these organisms is that it might be that we lose our populations of pagaris at certain sites or that the populations become really size restricted, that they can get up to a certain size and that's it. And those are sort of, young adults or sub-adults and they never really have the same reproductive potential and eventually they sort of get out compete in our local habitats um as a scientist i find this whole thing absolutely fascinating because this is a great example of how climate change can cause competitive interactions to arise in new ways and resources get differentially distributed and there's a lot to un unpack here and it's fascinating to study and observe but it's it's really terrifying and it's sad um i love the species i work with i love watching them and i love learning from them and the fact that they are suffering in these habitats is not great it's hard to watch and um i would love to say that my research would lead to some answers of how we could address the situation. Um, unfortunately, because this is not just 
a a competitive interaction that is arising from the presence of a non-native species it's also something that's informed by the abiotic environment by the fact that the water is changing so there's a few things going on here yes there's competition but it's competition in addition to other stressors so Pagoras is at a disadvantage and I don't know if that's something we can fix not without stopping and reversing climate change which good luck with getting everybody on board to do that what I do think it allows us to do is be more mindful of how non-native species can impact our native species be more mindful of recognizing non-native species when they appear and be mindful of the fact that we have some really beautiful and incredible native species that they may not survive in all of the habitats, but there might be some habitats in our local shores, along our local shores, that are refuges for these animals. And that is my hope, that there are going to be, as seems to be the case in Hannaful, there'll be portions of the inner tidal that remain sort of free of of Clibinarius and are not as impacted by climate change being lower in the shore, being less prone to salinity fluctuation and temperature fluctuation. Uh, so that is the research that I've been able to conduct on the topic of the clash of the crabs. Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate again, all of you coming and I would love to take any and all of your questions in the time that we have left. Oh, thank you. Uh